where you went for the new ideas, the creative ways of solving problems. And nowadays, that's not necessarily the case. Public universities, which educate nearly 70% of our college graduates, have declining graduation rates, rising costs of access, and higher rates of dissatisfaction from families and public inventor, uh, investors such as the uh, state legislatures who are funding them. And so here you're wondering, you know, what used to be, you know, I went to the University of Missouri, right? Great land-grant institution, something that the American public was really proud of. And now universities like that are not as accessible, and they're That's not right. necessarily the place where you go for the new ideas. We've got to change that. That's right. And I, I, I want to tell you, since the Department of Education was launched 30 years ago, this is the result of it. <laughs> so I, I think, uh, the, you know, candidate Ron Paul, he's right. You know, take away the Department of Education, give it back to the states, give their schools back to the counties, let them get the best teachers, let them hire, and of course you have to do it with the unions too, you know. Well, I don't think that this is about um, whether there's a Department of Education or not, and, you know, saying that all labor unions are a bad thing. In fact, I think it's about how we think about education. Higher education has been really focused on uh, maintaining scarcity, like scarce skills, and you should be exclusive. The more exclusive you are, the better you are. When really we need to be more inclusive, right? We need to be linking what's going on at the universities with our country's socioeconomic success, right? That these things are directly connected to one another, and we should no longer be separating them. And then you could see that the, the imperative for innovation is not just a process. It's the outcome. It's both. You know, Chile. In Chile, folks, when you go to school, you actually pay a fee. And sometimes a fee is larger than the average salary of a person. That's in school. And in Chile, they're having demonstrations every single day. They're riding right up to the politicians, standing on their tables and saying, no, we must have free education. If we don't have free education, the poor people will never get educated. It is the game of the rich people. So education is, of course, everywhere. Everybody's talking about it, and you sincerely hope that the world gets better at educating the kids because to get out of poverty, the only way to go is to get an education. Well, you know, speaking of poverty, the 2010 census numbers that were released in September have now been updated, and the poverty numbers are actually worse in this recent kind of supplemental study from the Census Bureau. Back in September, they were talking about 46.2 million Americans found to live in poverty. But now the new number, the new report, is 49.1 million Americans. Why, why the difference? Well, essentially what they're saying is that the Census Bureau has found a different way of calculating poverty, and this new measure is taking into account the huge amounts of money that are spent on social services benefits provided to the needy, as well as expenses such as medical care and payroll taxes. So when you take all of these things into account, you're getting a very different picture of poverty in America. One of the striking things, the poverty rate for the elderly is huge. The rate for those 65 and older was 15.9% based on the new measure. The old measure was saying it was only 9%. The big reason for that is out-of-pocket medical expenses which were not captured in those September, those official numbers, but the new report is capturing those out-of-pocket medical uh, uh, numbers. And unlike uh, the traditional method of measuring poverty, the new method is looking at poverty thresholds that are different for renters, for homeowners that are paying a mortgage, and owners who have no mortgage. So when you break it down and look at it in more detail, you get a more clear picture of really what poverty looks like in the U.S. That's a lot of old people just uh, alive because of the Social Security mm -hmm. net mm -hmm. that they have. Mm -hmm. Again, it, those numbers are pretty bad. Folks, there are 14 million unemployed people. Up until last year, 75% of them were receiving unemployment checks. And now because it's been more than a year, they're not receiving that. In fact, it's only 48% out of that 14 million. But the sad thing to see is, you know, they're trying to come up with a, a bill 
99 weeks of unemployment uh, to be given to people who were been unemployed. But unfortunately, most of the ones will not even uh, qualify for that because they have been unemployed for more than 99 weeks, so they will not be able to get that. But at the same time, you know, my heart goes out. These are holiday time. It's, you know, folks, if you can hire just one person, one person, please go out and hire because I really think it's businessmen who can hire. It's not the government that's going to solve the unemployment problem. So if you can find it in your heart on these holidays, if you can hire one person, it'll be good. You will have a better holiday. <laughs> You may have recently seen something in your email or, or on Facebook about leave the big bank and join a credit union. There have, has been a, quite a grassroots movement, anti-big bank movement, among people online, uh, fueled by groups like MoveOn.org, Progressive Change Campaign Committee, and we actually had an official bank transfer day last weekend. Essentially, a lot of people are being encouraged to take their accounts out of places like Bank of America, who are threatening all these higher fees, and move them into those local credit unions. And that has clearly happened. The business in the credit unions has gone up, and a lot of people are, are definitely lining up to start those new accounts. But the question in the CNN Money article is, what difference does it really make to the big banks? The big banks that these customers are leaving are so big that many of them have barely felt a dent in their account holdings. Not only that, but you know, they have so much money, they can't lend it out. So they're actually trying to reduce their asset. So this is something good for them, actually. But Occupy Wall Street will be very happy with it. If you don't punish <laughs> the banks, you know. That's how they look at it. But by the way, folks, you know, you would think that in a place called Hawaii, you'll have more millionaires. But that's really not the case. The most millionaires you will find is in the state of Maryland, right in our backyard. Here. Really? You know, you have 7.22% of the households that have assets that are more than a million dollars is in Maryland. Wow. Virginia is now far behind. 6.26%, number seven in the country with that many millionaire households. D.C., number 10 with 5.88% of all households are million and more. But state of Maryland is not grateful that they have so many millionaires, households among them. In fact, state of Maryland is considering a millionaire's tax. Really? They don't understand that the minute <laughs> you're going to do that tax, state of Virginia is going to be poaching them. Just like the story that you did about the uh, credit unions poaching on the big bank customers, that's what is going to happen. <laughs> Folks, have you ever heard of Google 20? You know, when uh, Google recruits new people, when they go to work at the campus, 